Should I start? Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say that if I'm going too fast, it's your fault. <laughs> so feel free to ask questions. And if you don't, I mean, if I'm, making, if I'm not making sense, just tell me, because... Um, what's that? You did, but you asked a question, but I didn't answer that. That's, you know, I reserve the right not to answer the questions, but... <laughs> We can start, <laughs> but it's a different blame then, it's a different issue. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about the exact tr triangle today um, in more detail. So let's just re recall that there was, um, so, so we had a relationship between the Fleur homology of Y, the Fleur homology of lambda frame surgery on K of Y, and the floor homology of lambda plus mu frame surgery on Y, on K. There's an exact triangle of this kind. Um, by the way, exact triangle is kind of a cute way of saying long exact sequence. Uh, three terms, this is an exact sequence. So where, where we use either the plus or the hat theory here. And, um, <coughs> I want to describe how these maps are constructed. So there, are, there are maps that connect these three, three manifolds, and they're all induced by cobordisms, but um, I want to explain how that's done. So <coughs> this construction is, uh, so, of maps. So the, um, the basic object is the following. If you have a pair of, of <coughs> so, so, so the basic construction, um, goes back to some constructions from Lagrangian fleur homology, uh, where the statement is that if you have, well, we know that if we have a pair of Lagrangians, like these pair of tori, then we can associate to them the Fleur homology, which, which we've been thinking of as the Fleur homology of the three manifold. So but these are the, the, the tori um, <coughs> belonging to our Hagar diagram. But what happens now if you have three tori? That is to say, if you have three G tuples of circles. So that is to say, to a pair of tori, in fact, I, I wrote a whole homology, but in fact, what we have is a chain complex whose generators are um, the intersection points and whose differentials count holomorphic disks. What happens if you have now not two, but three tori, T alpha, T beta, and T gamma? What does that give you? Well, that gives you a chain map. This induces a chain map. CF, T alpha, T beta, tensor, CF, T beta, T gamma, into CF, T alpha, T gamma. So the, the triple, to a to triple, triple one associates a chain map. Let's just use the hat theory now for, for simplicity. So um, how is that defined? Well, um, <coughs> f of x tensor y is going to be a sum over all, so x is now an intersection point between t alpha and t beta, y is an intersection point of t beta and t gamma. Well, we sum over all intersection points between t alpha and t gamma, and then we sum over all homotopy classes now, not of so it used to be Whitney disks. Now we have now we sum over our triangles. So we're going to look at holomorphic triangles whose um, one of whose edges goes to alpha, the other edge goes to beta, and the third edge goes to, to the gammas. 
and this is going to be x tensor y w. The set of such maps, homotopy classes of such maps, will be denoted pi 2 of x y w. Is it clear what I mean here? I mean homotopy classes of triangles, um, of, of, of maps from a standard triangle into the g-fold symmetric product, which map one edge into T alpha, another edge into T beta, and the third edge into T gamma, and it maps the three vertices to x, y, and w respectively, where x, y, and w are intersection points between these tori. So we sum over all triangles. Um, we want their, we look at, ho- we want the formal dimension of the moduli space to be zero dimensional, and since we're working in the hat theory, we also want their intersection point with the distinguished point, the intersection number with the distinguished point to be zero, and now we, s- we count the number of holomorphic such triangles and we let that be the <coughs> coefficient of w. This is now our chain map. And now, why is it a chain map? It's a chain map for the same reason that d squared equals zero in Lagrangian floor homology. That is to say, you count, you look at one-dimensional spaces. So, so we look at one parameter families of holomorphic triangles and we see what their ends are. Remember the proof of d squared equals zero had to do with looking at one parameter families of holomorphic disks and noticing that the only kind of degenerations they could undergo, at least in a non-trivial, with a non-trivial count, are when the flow line, the holomorphic disk splits. Well, in the same way, what you notice is that the only way a holomorphic triangle can split, degenerate, is we can split off a disk at one of the three, at one of the three vertices. <coughs> the, and, and now, so you look at the ends of one-dimensional moduli spaces, you see that they count with zero ends, and you notice that um, if you count that up differently, this looks like um, the differential, this looks like the differential of x, um, f of the differential of x tensor y. This looks like f of x tensor the differential of y. And this looks like the differential of x, f of x tensor y. And the fact that these all cancel, uh, these are ends of a one parameter family of maps says that they cancel. And that's precisely the statement that F is a chain map from the tensor complex into the, into the chain complex, right? See that? So, so this, is, this is the argument that says that F of boundary X tensor Y plus the F of X tensor boundary Y is equal to boundary of F of X tensor Y. And again, please forgive me, I'm not being very careful about my signs here so we can work on it too. But this is the statement that F is a chain map. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. Pardon? Why is this true? This is true because what you do is you look at, you look at what, you look at families of holomorphic triangles with formal dimension one rather than zero. And you, and you say that the, this family of modu- this moduli space of holomorphic representatives has finitely many ends. And the types of ends that it has are either when a holomorphic disk splits off at this vertex or it splits off at this vertex or it splits off at this vertex. Okay? And since the number of ends of a, of a one manifold with finitely many ends is, is zero mod two, the sign count of these is equal to zero. And that's this equation I boxed in. And that's why this is a homomorphism. This is the same as the argument that d squared equals zero. Okay? Is that clear? Why is the degenerate like that? I mean, that, that triangle looks like... Uh, why is that the bound? Why, why is that f the boundary of x? This one? Well, oh, I, I mean, that's just a question of where I put my t alpha. I'm thinking my t alpha, my t beta, and t gamma as being here. Well, so I mean, the, the middle one is where it's coming out of w, right? Um, but yeah. But, this but, is but why any of them? Pardon? Generating triangle that way is supposed to be the image of the chain map? Is that, why is that question on 
So y. So you put boundary x tensor y. That's that's boundary of x tensor y. So what? I, okay. So we were, why don't I be more? Why don't I could be a little bit more formal here? So, so here's. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at. Um, we're looking at um, <coughs> a one-parameter moduli space of triangles where I've got x here, I've got a y here, and I've got a w here. And the the ends of this are going to be all possible. This is has dimension one. And now, one po- kind of degeneration is when there's a, another intersection point, x prime, over here. And this is a one-dimensional moduli space. And this is a zero. This is over all possible x primes that can occur. The sum of those is the boundary of x. Okay? All right? Is everybody happy? So strictly speaking, what I've just shown, what, what I'm calculating here is the w component of the <coughs> of this expression. Okay? All right. <coughs> now I've said this in a bit, bit of generality here. We're not going to quite say it in such generality. We're going to say it for special choices of alpha, beta, and gamma. Well, of beta and gamma. So that's to say, if k is a knot inside of y, then there is a compatible Hagar diagram. Let's say k is a framed knot in, gamma, in y. There's a Hagar diagram for which one of the beta circles is actually a meridian for the knot. So I can push the knot itself into one of the handle bodies, and I can push it into the handle body in such a way that the last beta circle is a meridian for that knot. So there's, there's, we can build such a Hagar diagram. And, um, and if I have the framing along the knot, k, lambda, then I can alternatively choose um, a different choice of such beta circle to, to represent that same framing. So I'll call that lambda g. So let's just re- recall. I've got a knot sitting inside the handle body, and I'm assuming that it's a framed knot. So it has some push-off that lives out on the, on the surface sigma. Let's call that lambda g. Okay? And, is that clear? Sorry. Yeah? So why can you put this k if you are not Okay, so, so what you want to do is, given a knot k in a three-manifold, you want to construct a special Hagar diagram. And what you do is you delete a neighborhood of k, and you construct a handle body decomposition for the complement of the knot k. And then, at the very end, you fill in the solid torus. So you fill in the solid torus by attaching a disk, and the dual that disk is this um, last beta g. Okay? Okay? Now, um, and of course, different choices for that last circle correspond to different, sur- different Dane fillings of that three manifold. Okay. So, <coughs> what I want to choose now, I have these beta circles, beta 1 up to beta g. These are the other betas. I'm going to choose lambda circles, which are small push-offs. They're going to be effectively the same circle as the beta themselves. Just pu- I'm going to push it off very slightly for technical reasons. Um, the, the reason I push them off is that I want the lambda circles to be transverse to the beta circles. And now, we have, and, and of course we have our old set of alpha circles. So that is to say, we have alpha circles for y. These are our alpha circles for y. And we have beta circles for, for 
beta circles for y so that beta g is a meridian for k. And finally, we have lambda y naught to lambda g with the property that, that, that lambda i is isotopic to beta i. But um, for i less than g, and lambda g represents the framing of k. Now, now we have three sets of circles. Um, T alpha, T beta, and T gamma. What is the beta gamma three manifold? What's that? No, no, just just if I take beta and gamma and I look at that pair right there. G minus one for the Of S one cross S two, right? It's uh, not a lens space because it's an integer surgery. Oh, okay. So this is going to be th the beta gamma pair. This specifies a G minus one fold connected sum of S2 cross S1s. This pair, of course, is Y and, um, and, and the alpha gamma. This represents Y lambda of K. All right. So um, I've now neglected to tell you a very important piece of topology. I've told you the holomorphic geometry that underpins triples of, of, of circles, but I haven't told you what the topology was. If I have three G tuples of circles, what kind of low-dimensional object does that specify? It specifies a four-manifold. And the way it specifies a four-manifold is you take a triangle cross, cross sigma you, ta you attach a handle body cross an interval along the top edge, another handle body cross an interval along this edge, and a third handle body cross an interval along this edge, and we have now three three-manifolds that bound it. There's the Y alpha beta three-manifold, the Y beta gamma three-manifold, and the Y alpha gamma three-manifold. Okay? So let me just say it again. There's a four-manifold one construct by taking a triangle cross sigma, attaching a handle body cross an interval, handle body cross an interval, and a handle body cross an interval to it. And um, it's a four manifold with corners, but if you smooth out the corners, you get these three three manifolds that you get by pairing off the alphas and the gammas. I've already told you how to define a map from the floor homology of this tends to the floor homology of this into the floor homology of this. Well, we define that map to be somehow the invariant of this four manifold. But in the particular case at hand, um, what, we're, what, what, what we're talking about now is a special case of this where this end right here is a connected sum of G minus one copies of S2 cross S1. This is our original Y and this is Y lambda of K. <coughs> and now we're going to let the map here, F, I'm calling everything F. Maybe that's bad. Um, let's call this F alpha beta gamma. So this F here is going to be, will be F alpha beta gamma of some Fleur homology class coming from Y tensored with a canonical Fleur homology class on the beta gamma three manifold. So what we're supposed to recall now is the Fleur homology of a connected sum of S2 cross S1s. The Fleur homology of S2 cross S1 is the same as the homology of the circle. And in fact, if I take L copies of S2 cross S1, this is isomorphic to the ordinary homology of a g-dimensional torus. So that is to say, it has, um, well, the flow homology of a d-dimensional torus. There's a top dimensional cohomology class. So I say recall, I don't know if uh, that was actually 
stated last time, last week. But the, the point is that um, I think Zoltan did talk about S2 cross S1. The <coughs> floor homology of S2 cross S1 has two generators, one here and one here. They differ in dimension by one, and the differential of one is zero. And the the, there, there are no differentials. And now, if you form a connected sum of this with itself, that just forms a tensor product. So there's a, there's a canonical top dimensional generator, and that's the generator theta that we stick into here. So theta, beta gamma, is the top dimensional generator of HF hat of the connected sum of G minus 1 copies of S2 cross S1. And those are the maps. Okay? Are there any questions? Could you explain in what sense this is a format? So this is a four manifold by construction. It's, it's, um, we take the triangle cross sigma, that's a four manifold. Take a handle body cross an interval, that's another four manifold. We glue them together along their boundary. So we're constructing actually a four manifold here. No, no, there's, there's no, so, I just take a topological disk, a topological triangle, I cross it with sigma. Well, so the boundary of the resulting object is three. The boundary of the resulting object is, 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 if you like, three copies of sigma cross an interval, and there are certain corner points. And along this copy of sigma cross interval, we attach the alpha handle body cross an interval. Okay, any other questions? Okay, incidentally, topologically, in the case that we c are considering here, it's not difficult to convince yourself that if you fill in this connected sum of S2 cross S1s by disk D3 cross S1s, then, um, then this resulting four manifold is precisely the two-handle addition. It's, it's, the two, it's the canonical two-handle addition to Y. If you like, that could be an exercise. Um, okay. All right. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. So, so if you have a single, if you have a single S two cross S one, there are two generators. There's a top, and they differ in dimension by one, and the differentials are trivial. So this is like the homology of a circle. The Fleur homology of S2 cross S1 is the ordinary homology of a circle, right? Because I've got two generators, A and B. The differentials are as trivial, and they differ in dimension by one. And now, if I just form a connected sum of this picture with itself, that's forming a tensor product of that complex with itself. And that's why it's the homology of torus. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Yes. I don't Yeah. I've constructed also this map from holomorphic geometry, right? F alpha beta. G so forget about the four manifold. I mean, the four manifold is inspiring, and, but but right now the construction of the map is as follows. There, there was, I constructed in the beginning of the lecture this chain map from the floor homology of this tends to the floor homology, the chain complex of this tends to the chain complex of this and the chain complex of this. And that's this F alpha beta gamma. And now I look at the induced map on homology, take, a, take um, what, what, we, what we have is given a homology class C in HF hat of T alpha of Y, I define F of C to be F alpha beta gamma of C tensor, this canonical Fleur homology class for the beta gamma pair. Okay, is that clear? And um, that's, th that's the math. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so probably you can guess what this math is going to be. 
So for this map, we have <coughs> we have beta, lambda, well, we also have a gamma, or we also have a delta, which is a curve which goes around and twists. So there's a third curve, delta, like this, which, and <coughs> which represents beta plus lambda, beta g plus lambda g. And just symmetrically, you use, you use the corresponding, um, well, this picture is symmetric in choice of beta, lambda, and delta. So I can make the same definition um, if instead of using the beta gamma pair, I could use the gamma delta pair, and then I use alpha gamma delta. Okay, so maybe I'll be a little more clear. So now let F, this, this one is F1, say, then we could define F2 to be F2 of eta is going to be F alpha gamma delta of eta tensor theta. Um, and, now, and now you're using the um, gamma delta pair. <coughs> okay? And now the point is, the point here is that, that um, <coughs> I said that, oh, I didn't write it up neatly. So the, the, point, the point in, the, in our definition was that, was that the pair T beta, T gamma, this, that is to say, the sigma beta 1 up to beta gamma, beta g, um, lambda 1 up to lambda g, this specifies a connected sum of g minus 1 copies of S2 cross S1. Well, so does the pair um, lambda 1 up to lambda g and delta 1 up to delta g. It also specifies the same three manifold because, um, oh, I guess I haven't told you, I didn't reveal that for my choices of delta circles, I'm going to use one more isotopic copy of the same betas up to here until the very last one. And the last one, I use the, the circle that corresponds to lambda plus beta. So it's a circle that meets both beta g and lambda g in a single point. So this, this three manifold, um, um, T beta, T delta, this specifies a connected sum of g minus one copies of S2 cross S1. And so does, um, sorry, this is T lambda. And so does T delta, T beta. This also forms G minus one copies of S2 cross S1. Okay? <coughs> is this clear? No. Yes? No? Okay. The capital, so the point is that, that the beta gamma pair specifies something that's topologically a G minus 1 connected to some S2 cross S1s. Yes. Therefore, it is a canonical top dimensional Fleur homology class. Oh, maybe I should write that. Right. And you do the same thing for the other pairs, gamma delta and delta beta. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Now, We now have our maps. <coughs> and the question is, why is this a long exact sequence? So, No, I, you, you, do the, you do the same construction. Sorry, for F3, we're going to use theta delta beta.
Okay? Now, what I'd like to argue is that F2 composed with F1 is zero in homology. Okay? So, um, I said it was an exact sequence. Part of proving that it's exact is first to prove that it's a chain complex. So, I, I want to describe why that's true. So, um, F1 corresponds to, F1 belongs to the map that takes us from, that counts holomorphic triangles where we stick in this canonical top dimensional generator, theta, beta, gamma, for, into this vertex, right? So, we, um, we have an incoming C and we count how many holomorphic triangles there are whose vertices are at C and at theta and see where, where they come out. And now we're going to compose this with with F2, which counts holomorphic triangles like this, okay? So we're counting how many holomorphic triangles. This composite, so F2 circle F1 of C is equal to a sum over all W's of a sum over all, well, it's really bad to write this out as, as sums. Um, but, um, so maybe I'll, uh, is this picture clear enough? Or should, should I write it out? Some, I'll write it out in the sum for once. Okay, so we're, sum, we're summing over all W in T alpha intersect T beta over a sum over all um, homotopy classes of maps from, uh, let's call this, so this is what we call, pardon? W is in, the, is in T alpha intersect T, T delta. Thank you. So, if, let's, if we start with an X here, then um, we're summing over all W's for T alpha intersect T delta over, over all... <coughs> so, the inner sum is going to be over all homotopy classes. There's going to be V's here, so let me just write out slowly, sorry. So, F1 of X is what? F1 of X is the sum over all V's over a sum of all C and pi 2 of X, Y, V. Um, this is, this is F1 of X, this is theta, beta, <coughs> gamma. And now we're going to sum over all W's and then sum over all C primes of pi 2, in pi 2 of X, theta, gamma, delta, V. This times the number of points in M C prime times, um, times W. All right? Pardon? Yes. Oh, it's V. Sorry. All right. <coughs> okay, but more pictorially, it's, we're just counting how many holomorphic triangles there are that juxtapose like this across a V. And what we want, what we want to argue is that the number of such holomorphic juxtapositions is equal to zero up to homology. And the point of this now is what's called the associativity for the holomorphic triangle construction, which says that <coughs> if we count holomorphic triangles, Of, with a break like this, the, such, the number of such holomorphic triangles is up to boundaries the same as the number of holomorphic triangles of this type. So, I'll, ma I'll make this more precise in a moment. More precisely, this composite is defining a chain map, and this composite also defines a chain map. So, what do I mean here? What I mean here is that, uh, over here I mean we're taking F 
of F tensor theta beta gamma. And then we're taking F of this tensor theta gamma delta. This right here is taking F of theta beta gamma tensor F of theta gamma delta. And that's tensored with. So these are two chain maps. And the statement is that these two chain maps are chain homotopic. OK, why are they chain homotopic? The reason they're chain homotopic is. Yes. Yes, I mean, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You're right, I'm sorry. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And this over here then is going to be alpha, beta, gamma. This is going to be um, alpha, gamma, delta. Whereas this is going to be f of, of beta, gamma, delta. And this is going to be f of alpha, um, beta, delta. OK? So the reason these maps are, OK, is that clear? So now the reason that those things are chain homotopic is that we can count holomorphic squares, rectangles, which <coughs> where again I'm putting in theta, beta, gamma here, and I put theta, gamma, delta here, and I've got my x coming in here and a w coming out. And we now look at one parameter families of these and see how they can degenerate. And it, I say rectangles, I'm not going to specify the conformal structure of the rectangle. So the rectangle, so there are, what kinds of ends are there? So I'm looking at, I'm looking at now at moduli space of holomorphic maps of the rectangle into our, into our g-fold symmetric product, which satisfies these boundary conditions. The top edge goes to alpha, the left edge goes to beta, the bottom edge to gamma, right edge to, to delta. And we look at how, what kind of degenerations can happen in one parameter families. Well, there are the usual degenerations that can happen in one parameter families that we can split off little holomorphic disks at any of the four edges, uh, any of the four vertices. There are four, four such, such kinds of boundaries. But then there are two more interesting kinds of degenerations that can happen, which happen when the conformal structure of the rectangle is degenerated. Either the rectangle can degenerate into a pair of triangles like this, or it can degenerate into a pair of triangles like this. Right? So if the conformal modulus of the rectangle becomes very long over in this direction, then the, the, the sequence of maps is going to converge to a juxtaposition of two, tri two holomorphic triangles. And if the modulus goes in the opposite direction, then um, so maybe I should just recall an exercise. The conformal moduli of quadrilaterals is identified with the real numbers. And uh, the reason for that is that every quadrilateral in the plane, say, can be made um, holomorphically equivalent to a, a rectangle. And when you make it into a rectangle, you look at the ratio of the height, height to its um, width. And that has two ends, and those correspond to, the two, to these two types of degenerations. So when we count the... Um, I'm not choosing the conformal structure on the rectangle. No, I, I'm allowing the conformal structure on the quadrilateral to vary arbitrarily. So now our usual story that says that the number of ends of a one-manifold with boundary is equal to zero shows that, that there's a map that you can define which counts holomorphic quadrilaterals. Maybe I should write it up. So we can define now.
So we can define H alpha, beta, gamma, delta of X to be a sum over all W's in T alpha intersect T delta over, um, oh sorry, X, let's say, X tensor theta alpha, theta beta gamma tensor theta gamma delta to be a sum over all W's over a sum over all quadrilaterals theta, beta, gamma, theta, gamma, delta, W. Again, so the, the formal dimensional moduli space is zero and the intersection number with Z is zero. The number of holomorphic representatives of phi times W. We can define such a map and that argument over there shows that boundary H plus H boundary is equal to, um, well, let me just, let me drop my subscripts here. It's not too evil. So, the subscripts are right up there. Okay, so this is, well, it's beta gamma, gamma delta, beta gamma. Gamma delta. Now they're down here. Um, this is alpha, beta, gamma. This is alpha, gamma, delta. That's uh, this is f of beta, gamma, delta, and this is f of alpha, beta, delta. Okay. Um, so the the terms that look for like boundary H plus H boundary are these four terms. And I've written down the additional two terms on the right-hand side. So that shows that these two chain maps are chain homotopic to a one another. And that's, that, that was the claim that I made. So now, <coughs> this is a general construction in Lagrangian floor homology. So <coughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to, to use this to argue that F2 composed with F1 is equal to zero on homology. And the reason for that is that we have HF of Y going to HF of Y lambda going to HF of Y beta <coughs> of Y. <coughs> so <coughs> this is the y, y, this is Y lambda plus delta of k, but that is to say this is the three manifold that's gotten by the alpha beta pair, this is the three manifold that's gotten by the alpha lambda pair, and this is the three manifold that's gotten by the lambda delta pair. And what we have to simply argue is, <coughs> well, F2 composed with F1 is the first term over here. What we have to argue is that this term is equal to zero. And to that end, it suffices to show that this evaluation is equal to zero. So, but this, this calculation takes place in the beta, gamma, delta triple. So it has nothing to do with the alpha circles. It's a completely model calculation. Remember the, um, unfortunately, um, <coughs> I'm doing kind of Um, my blackboard technique, such as it is, has degenerated completely. Um, um, <coughs> but the point is that, that we, had, we, had, we had here a beta circle, we had a lambda circle, and we had a delta circle, which, which meets them both. Maybe the beta circle was red. Um, we had our beta circle, we have our lambda circle, and we have a delta circle, which meets both once. Um, and what we have to do is we have to do a model calculation in this case. So there's, there's one copy of that and there are um, G minus one copies of something even more standard.
Let me focus on this picture and let me draw it again differently to see it, things more clearly. In that remaining torus, we have, so here's a torus, we have beta, we have lambda, and we have delta. And <clears throat> I'm ignoring everything else that's happening in the rest of the surface. So in fact, we can assume, let's assume for simplicity that in fact there's no rest of the surface for just a moment. Let's just put our base point out here, z. And now we have, um, right, so this circle we called beta, this circle we called delta, and this circle we called um, lambda. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to calculate f of theta, beta, gamma, tensor theta, gamma, delta. So, <coughs> here's beta. How many points does it hit meet? Oh, this is not lambda, but gamma. How many points does it meet gamma in? It meets it in a single point. So this is, remember this is the connected sum g minus 1 copies of s2 cross s1, but I'm now looking at the case where g equals 1. So there's just an s3. So theta, beta, gamma in this case, picture is a single point. What is theta, gam gamma, delta? It's a single point as well. And now, we're supposed to count how many holomorphic triangles. We're, tri we're supposed to count holomorphic triangles um, whose, well, here's a holomorphic triangle, right? The, um, maybe, maybe it would be even clearer if, if I had the vertical line, if I moved beta over a little bit. So this, here's beta. <coughs> and this is identified with this. So there's, you see here a holomorphic triangle. So you see that, um, that if I take theta, beta, gamma, theta, beta, gamma, tensor theta, gamma, delta, theta, sorry, theta, beta, gamma, tensor theta, gamma, delta, there's a unique holomorphic triangle, at least in this sort of, not a unique, but we see a holomorphic triangle right here that goes from theta, beta, gamma, tensor theta, gamma, delta, to theta, beta, delta. But that holomorphic triangle has a friend right here, which is in a different homotopy class. So we see that, that this map, which is going to be a sum over all homotopy classes of maps, of triangles, the number of holomorphic representatives of that triangle, consists of a sum of two terms. This is going to be um, um, it's going to be some coefficient times theta um, beta delta, but that coefficient is going to be the number of holomorphic representatives of the, holomo of the homotopy class of holomorphic triangles C1 plus the number of holomorphic representatives of the homotopy class C, let's call it C minus 1. And by the Riemann mapping theorem, C1 has a unique representative and C minus 1 also has a unique representative, so that these two terms at least mod 2 cancel. And now we're supposed to see what are the other homotopy classes of triangles. I've just written up two homotopy classes of triangles. There are other homotopy classes of triangles. There's, for example, this larger homotopy class of triangle but it uses the base point C. So there are only two homotopy classes of triangle that don't use the base point Z, and they're the ones that are used in the hat theory. So they, they, their terms cancel. So, so theta, beta, gamma, tensor theta, gamma, delta is equal to zero. So, <coughs> by the associativity theorem, now it follows that since 
but since this was by definition F2 composed with F1, we've just shown that F2 composed with F1 is equal to zero. This is equal, this, since this term right here is equal to zero. So I did a model case when G equals one, and in real life we need to take a product with these additional triangles, but um, in each of these additional factors there's a unique holomorphic triangle, you just take the product of, this holo of the holomorphic triangles you have here with those standard holomorphic triangles there, and the same argument goes through. Okay? All right, that was maybe a little bit fast, but, um, but, um, but the point is that, the, that the, to prove that F2 composed with F1 is zero, you use the associativity law to reduce to a model calculation in the beta gamma delta triple, and in the beta gamma delta triple, there are only two holomorphic, there are two homotopy classes of triangles that, that don't use the reference point Z, and each one has a unique holomorphic representative in them, and therefore, the, the pairing of theta beta gamma with theta gamma delta is equal to zero. Okay, so this is, if not a proof of the exact, of the exact triangle, it is um, a proof of a part of it, which is <coughs> this, so this argument is what's used to show that the map from HF hat of Y alpha beta to HF hat So, so far, I've shown that this composite is zero, and it's not hard to also show that this composite is zero. It's sort of a symmetric argument. Um, yeah, it's the same argument. Um, it's a permutation of notation. Okay. Um, are there any questions? Yes? How do you show exactness? Okay. So, um, <coughs> exactness, there, there are two, two arguments to prove exactness. Um, are there any other questions before I address exactness in the remaining five minutes of my lecture? Pardon? Yeah, I'm, the description, the discussion that I've had so far all works with Z mod 2 coefficients, though if you look back over it carefully, you can insert signs to make things drop out in pairs. Okay, so how do you prove exactness? So um, there's, a, there's a very cute proof of exactness that uses a lemma from homological algebra, which um, <coughs> I think is originally due to Kuntsevich. I learned about some version of this from Paul Zeidel. But the, the um, statement is that if If you have three chain complexes, so AI are chain complexes, and the FIs from AI to AI plus one are chain maps, <coughs> then suppose that, suppose that, so that in itself doesn't give you a long exact sequence in homology. But if you know that Fi plus one composed with Fi is, induces zero in homology, then you at least have a hope of being exact. So we're going to assume that this composite is chain homotopic to zero by a homotopy Hi. So we're going to assume the existence of homotopies H1, H2, and H3. which are null homotopies of Fi plus one composed with Fi. So this is our first assumption. Our second assumption is, so is that clear, the notation clear? So the notation means that boundary Hi plus Hi boundary is supposed to be equal to Fi plus one, um, F composed with Fi. And the second statement is that, um, F composed with H plus H composed with F, which now is a map from A to itself. This should be chain homotopic to the identity map. 
if these two conditions are satisfied, then, um, then the maps on homology fit into an exact sequence. So let me leave this as an exercise. This is a pure exercise in homological algebra. Um, you have to know what a mapping cone is. But, um, but once you know that, this becomes an exercise in homological algebra. So what we're supposed to do now is we're supposed to understand we already have these chain homotopies. The chain homotopies are the counts of holomorphic squares. What we have to now understand is why... Um, so, we, when we count holomorphic squares from alpha, beta, gamma, delta, these furnish, this furnishes our, our chain homotopy because it, this furnishes the homotopy between um, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and zero, right? Because this is alpha, beta, gamma, delta. We already proved that the, the pairing in the beta, gamma, delta triple is zero. So this, <coughs> so that was bad back, blackboard technique. But the point is that, that, that the counts of the holomorphic squares give you um, the null homotopies of the juxtapositions of the triangle maps. And what we have to now understand is if I take a square and juxtapose it with a triangle, and then I add triangle juxtaposed with a square, that's the F composed with H plus H composed with F. That's supposed to be chain homotopic to the identity map. And um, to verify that, again, reduces to a model calculation. And again, I'm sorry, here I should have, I should put in alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and <coughs> I'm coming back to beta. This is alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And I'm coming back to beta again. So this, this is, um, okay, is this clear? So our H is supposed to be the homotopy that takes us from the alpha, beta, gamma, d from the alpha, beta, three manifold, to the alpha, delta, three manifold. And now we compose that with uh, map to, that goes back to the delta, alpha, beta, three manifold, which is <coughs> counting triangles like this. So this is, this is F composed with H. H composed with F counts triangles of this type. And we have to show that this is ch chain homotopic to the identity map. And now the proof involves looking at maps of holomorphic pentagons. So if you look at the ends of the moduli space of holomorphic pentagons, then that has, and now we're looking at alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and beta again. Incidentally, we want all of our tori to be transverse to each other. So for this reason, we take a little Lagrangian and push off a beta from the cell. But we're counting the ends of the moduli spaces of holomorphic pentagons. There are five kinds of ends. Either, well, there are all the usual ends that happen when, when disks come off the end of vertices, but there are five interesting kinds of degenerations corresponding to the five places where a pentagon can degenerate like this. We have one end that corresponds to a square and a, and a triangle, another end that has a square and a triangle, and a third end which has a triangle up here in the square. So again, I'm not writing in, I should write this alpha, beta, gamma, delta, beta prime, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, beta prime, and alpha, beta, gamma, delta, beta prime. And then there are these two additional types of degenerations. So we, now I claim that all these contributions cancel because they're, again, the same model, model calculation. This is, this is the pairing of theta, beta, gamma, theta, beta, gamma, with theta, gamma, delta. And this, the count of these holomorphic triangles, again, drops out in squares. That's the calculation we did over there. So these drop out, these drop out. This is one thing we want, plus this is another thing we want. We're going to say that it's chain homotopic the identity map. So this now reduces to a model calculation, again, in our little favorite square. And our little favorite square, what we do is we take another copy of beta and we push it off. <coughs> How far over have I gone? 
about a minute. And now, what we're trying to understand is we're trying to, what are we trying to count? We're trying to count holomorphic squares which go between theta, beta, gamma, theta, gamma, delta, and theta, delta, beta prime, and end up at theta, beta, beta prime. Well, <coughs> there are, now the picture is not quite as symmetric as it used to be because we have this pair beta and beta prime. Um, <coughs> so beta, beta prime, say here's theta, beta prime, beta, beta prime. Here's the canonical top dimensional generator for, for the beta, beta prime pair. And now we're supposed to count holomorphic rectangles. Well, here's a perfectly good holomorphic rectangle, and it's unique in its conformal class by uh, the Riemann mapping theorem. And you might say that it might be a holomorphic rectangle. So this is slightly smaller than the holomorphic triangle we saw a moment ago. You might worry that there's another holomorphic rectangle on the other side. But the holomorphic rectangle on the other side has both positive and negative, or the, the homotopy class has both positive and negative multiplicities. Therefore, um, it can't, has no holomorphic representatives. So the only, um, there's only one homotopy class of rectangles which can have holomorphic representatives, and it has one. That proves that this, quadril this quadrilateral pairing of theta, uh, beta, gamma, theta, gamma, delta, and theta, be delta, beta prime is actually equal to theta, beta, beta prime. And you finally have to prove that, that if, I, if I look at I count holomorphic triangles between um, alpha, beta, and beta prime, where beta prime is a small push-off of beta, then this actually induces an isomorphism in homology. So this is basically doing nothing if, if beta prime is sufficiently close to beta. So that's the, the verification in a nutshell of the second property, and um, that completes the proof of exactness. Um, okay, are there any questions? What was that? When you say drops out as before, you mean, I mean, I mean that, that these triangles come in pairs. Oh, okay. As the previous model calculation. Yeah. I mean, in fact, it is exactly the previous model calculation. Okay? Okay. Any questions? <coughs>